It hardly seems possible that our couple of weeks here in the Brisbane area, Ipswich, have come to a close. We leave on Tuesday for Sydney, and then after one week back to the Philippines, it's been a delight to be with you all, to enjoy fellowship with those who were able to be at the conference, and to be with you again now this Lord's Day, to worship our great, almighty, majestic God. Now, as, I, as we gather here this morning, I'm conscious that uh, as I look up, out over this sea of faces, uh, some of which, some of whom have... Uh, we have come to know, we've had fellowship together, some are new to me, but I see there are some who are, what shall we say, older, and some who are younger. And I want to address not just the younger ones, but especially the younger ones this morning. We who are older have a treasure, have something which is very precious to us, and something which we would like to share with you. And just a bit of background before I tell you what that treasure is. Those of us who are, who are older have, and who have come to know the Lord, have come to know Jesus, our Savior, our Master, we came to know Him at a time when for most people, even professing Christians, God was small and man was big. And there was much talk about man and his decision and so on. And, and God was there pleading with men to come to know him. But when we came to know God, when he revealed himself to us, he revealed himself as not a little God, but as a great, majestic God, a God of power, a God of might, a God of sovereign reigning rule who sat in majesty upon a throne. And our eyes were opened by God's kindness. We saw that God was not some pitiable small being pleading with men to notice him, but a God upon a throne. And this is the treasure, dear young people, and, and those who are maybe not so young, but you've not come to know God yet. We have a treasure that we would like to share with you. And that treasure is our God a God of sovereignty, a God of perfection, a God of goodness and kindness. And we want you to know this, God, because what we have here in this church, and, and I've come to know you, and I can say this with confidence, is not just a list of doctrines that we hold that make us different from other churches. What we have is a great God. And sad to say, many churches have forgotten if they ever knew who this God is. So let's come and pray and ask God again to reveal himself, not just certain truths. That's, that's part of it, but there are truths about God. We want to know this great, majestic, holy, kind, good God this morning. And we want you, young and old, if you don't know him yet, we want you to know him as well and treasure this great reality, the God who made us, the God who rules all things. Let's pray to him. Our great God, as we bow before you, we acknowledge that you are king, king of kings, Lord of lords. You shall reign forever and ever. You do reign even now in heaven and on earth. We ask that you would open our eyes, lift our eyes this morning from these things that surround us, uh, whether they are delightful things or things that bring us sorrow and pain and heartache, that you would lift our eyes from these things on high that we might see who you are and that seeing who you are, we would then know what we were made for to glorify, to know, to enjoy you forever and ever. Speak to our hearts, God. We cannot do this by the voice of men, but we ask that your Spirit would take the word proclaimed this morning home to the heart and reveal yourself to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, there are three headings that I'd like to uh, use to direct your thoughts to who this God is that we proclaim, that we believe here this morning. And I'll, I'll admit right off the bat that I borrowed the headings. They're borrowed. They're borrowed from my pastor and mentor, Pastor Al Martin, who preached a series of sermons 35 years or so ago, and these were three headings or titles of sermons, and they're going to be headings of points. So we're not, we don't have time to do a series on this, but I want us to get a vision, just in a sort of a, a brief aerial survey way of who is this God that we gather together to worship this morning. And let me just give a little hint of application before we even start. What will make your worship even more vibrant, delightful, thriving, heart beating with love to God and life is to remember who is it we're worshiping. So this is to feed into our worship as well. Well, what are the three headings? First of all, we want to see that God is a God of absolute perfection. A God of absolute perfection. Secondly, He is a God of unrivaled sovereignty. Unrivaled sovereignty. And thirdly, we want to see this morning that He is a God of infinite goodness. Infinite goodness. What a God that we gather together to worship. First of all, He is a God of absolute perfection absolute perfection. We're going to see this from his own words, his own revelation of who he is. Let's turn first of all to 1 John 1.5. We see first of all that his person is perfect. He is a God who is in his own being absolutely perfect. There is moral perfection in God. 1 John 1.5, a verse familiar perhaps to many. And this is the message John writes which we have heard from him, from Jesus, as John walked with Jesus on the surface of this earth. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Perfect, pure light, no darkness at all. This is what David spoke of in Psalm 5, 4. You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. So God in his own being has no stain of sin, of evil, of moral decay, of anything wrong at all. We cannot accuse God, although men try, there is no accusation that will stick because he is perfectly holy and good and morally upright. Now, the best of men is a man at best. And all pastors, I think I mentioned this at the conference, have clay feet. And if you just look at men, you're going to be disappointed. You look at me too closely, you'll be disappointed as well. Just ask my wife. We're not perfect. But God, there is nothing that you can point at him and say, he blew it here. He made a mistake there. He did something wrong in this instance. Absolutely nothing morally evil. No hint of darkness. So his person is perfect. But then as we go on with this same theme, we have to notice too that his ways are perfect. Not only is he perfect in his being, but he's perfect in what he does. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And here in this song of Moses, Moses declares this. And remember, Moses had gone through the wilderness. Moses had gone through many tough times. Moses had faced difficulties, even rebellions. Surely men were not perfect. But this is what he says of God. Deuteronomy 32, 4. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways 
are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. All his ways, his work is perfect. What, not only in his being, but what he does. We cannot find fault, or we must not find fault, with the outfoldings of what God has accomplished here in the history of the world. Same thing is spoken by David again in Psalm 18 this time. Psalm 18 and verse 30. Turn with me there. Psalm 18 and verse 30. As for God, His way, His way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in Him. Again, all that He does, all of His doings, all of His plans, all of the things that we have experienced, if we look back over the history of our days, whether it's a few years for those who are young, or whether it's uh, generations for those who are older, and you can look back over many years of experiences, Sometimes young people, when there are those who are older, have been through a lot of things, they get kind of sour. You know why? Some old people seem grumpy, not here, I hope, but some old people seem grumpy because they've seen a lot of hardship. Well, when we experience a lot of hardship, our tendency is to complain, and if we know that God is in control, then we begin to complain about Him, against Him. Why am I sick? Why do I have this disease? Why do I have this physical struggle? Why is my body prone to colds and coughs, and I never seem <coughs> to get over it? Why is my husband so cruel, so harsh, unsympathetic? Why are my parents like this? My dad, oh, I wish I had another dad. You know, you start grumbling and complaining about things that you personally experience. Well, you know why? You can't blame God. Why is the world in the mess it's in? One little word, sin. It all started in the garden with Adam's sin, and it continues with our own personal sin. We don't blame God. We blame men. God's way is perfect. And you know, God is still even sovereign, though men are sinners. And God can work through, in spite of, even because of, the sins of men. God is still in control. Just remember old Joseph sitting on the back of a camel, riding away from his brothers who sold him into slavery. What's, David's conclu uh, what's Joseph's conclusion? You meant it for evil, my brothers, but God meant it for good. Even in the trials, the difficulties, even in the experiences that we face because of man's wickedness and our own wickedness, God is still in control. and His ways are perfect. And when we come to know Him and face those trials and difficulties and heartbreaks, we can still say, God's good. God's ways are perfect. God means it for good. His ways are perfect. But one more thing before we move on to the next point. His person is perfect. His ways are perfect. But also His word is perfect. And in the changing scenes of life with the trials and difficulties and heartbreaks, we have a, an anchor a, a, a rock, a comfort for our souls in His Word. Psalm 19, verse 7. And here we're in Psalms. Just turn the page. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord, and for David, that was his whole Bible, the books of Moses. The law of the Lord is perfect, 
blameless, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. This book is the word of the Lord. How are we going to endure in the midst of the heartbreaks? God is perfect. Well, how do I know what he's about in these circumstances? How can I endure these circumstances? Well, we read in the book of Romans of the comfort and encouragement of the scriptures. God's word's perfect. And dear young people, you want to find your way through the shoals and the rocks and the uh, difficulties of this world, the reefs that will cause your soul to make shipwreck, you have the guide in the word of the Lord, which is perfect. So here it is, a God of absolute holiness and perfection. Now at each point along the way, I want to stop and show you the importance of this treasure. We have a perfect God. We have a holy God. We have an upright God. What's so important about that, young people, that you get hold of it? Well, this is the only way we will have a right relation, a right response to this God. What's the reflex response of a soul that sees God is holy, God is perfect, God is light, and there's no darkness in Him? The only proper reflex response for us sinners is to say God's holy I'm a sinner God is perfect light in me there's darkness and this is exactly what Isaiah experienced there in the temple and we don't need to turn there you know the passage many of you and I'll just relate its contents in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah goes into the temple and he has that vision that God is in the temple, high, lifted up, lofty, exalted. And those cherubim, those seraphim, are, those flaming angels are crying back to one another, back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. And the text tells us that the foundations the thresh of the threshold of the door of the temple are shaking with the voice of the angels. Now, some might accuse me of preaching loudly. I cannot make this building shake with my voice. Isaiah was in the temple and the angels are crying, this God before us is a holy God. And it wasn't just the foundation that was trembling. Isaiah's knees were trembling. And he fell before God. He says, woe is me. I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips. He thought of his speech. And if anybody here thinks you're pretty good, just replay the tapes of your words over this past week. No, you have unclean lips too. And your words, the tape recording of what you have said is that transcript which will accuse you in the day of judgment. President Nixon some 40 years ago tried to destroy the tapes or hide the tapes that revealed what he was really like. Before God, you cannot hide the tapes. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you come to know God in His absolute perfection, no evil, no moral decay, no accusation that will stick, absolute perfection in all he says, in all he does, in all he is. How can I stand before that God? How can I face that God? Let that thought register and remain with you. And dear friend, if ever you start thinking, I'm a pretty good bloke. I'm all right. I'm okay, Jack. Go back and look at God 
in his absolute perfection. But we don't stop there. Secondly, we want to move on and consider that this God that we worship, this God that we serve, this God we have come to know, is a God of unrivaled sovereignty. A God of unrivaled sovereignty. God sits on a throne. And the Psalms declare this again and again. We're still in the Psalms. Turn to Psalm 93. Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. Now there's a truth to give comfort to His people and fear to His enemies. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded Himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. God's throne is not trembling or shaking. Now, we prayed earlier for the prime minister and for her cabinet, her advisors, the prime minister or the president in, in our country. Uh, they don't know everything, and maybe they'll at least acknowledge that. And that's why they have a cabinet. They have the minister of this and the minister of that and the secretary of the other thing, interior, defense, and so on and so forth, because they can't know everything. And they need someone to give them advice, direction, guidance, policy statements, so that they can know how to act in certain circumstances, how to direct the country in its overall uh, ways and, and the, the policies that will be put into place. God has no cabinet. God has no advisors. God has no counselors. God has no need of experts to tell him what would be the best thing to do. Why? Because God knows everything. He sits on a throne alone. And we see this again and again in the Scriptures. Let's just turn to a few. And I have a number of texts in my notes, but we're going to focus on uh, three passages this morning. Turn, first of all, with me to Psalm 115. Psalm 115, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, and here's the cry of every humble Christian heart. Not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He does whatever he pleases. No one's advising him. No one's saying, God, it would please you to do this. God, we think it's best if you take that course of action. God does what he pleases. He is an absolute monarch. Furthermore, if we turn to Isaiah chapter 14 as an illustration of this, there was a time when the nation of Judah was besieged by the Assyrian army. Things looked pretty bleak. Looked like their nation had come to the end of its line. The future was dark. But here's what we find God doing. Isaiah 14, verse 24. Verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand to break Assyria in my land, and I will trample him on my mountains. Then his yoke will be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulder. This is the plan devised against the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his outstretched hand... Who can turn it back? The armies of Assyria came, surrounded the capital. God blew on them, 
and destroyed them. God is an absolute sovereign. Well, why did he let them do that? Why did he allow this mighty nation of Assyria even to get there in the first place? He has a lesson to teach his own people that they should not trust in men, that they should not trust in Egypt to deliver them or some other nation, but that they should trust in the Lord their God. And so it was. He says, this is what I plan to do. That's exactly what happened. And nobody could stop it. Because what God plans, that's what he does. What a God. Not an idol, not one that I described at the camp that you can carry, you can put him in his seat on the airplane, buckle him in, and he's not going to buckle you in. He's not going to save you. You've got to buckle him in. No, our God is in the heavens. Another text, one more passage, Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, verse 33. Who is this God that we worship? He's a great God. Greater than we can fathom. But look at what Paul says about him. Oh, the depths. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him, he is the source. And through him, he is the means. And to him, he is the end, are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, what are the implications of these passages? God's the source, He's the means, He's the end, He's the beginning, He's the alpha, He's the end, He's the omega. What's the implication? Well, just think about this. God is sovereign over creation. He made the world and all things in it according to His plan. This, this past Friday, we went to the Australian Zoo, saw some marvelous creatures. Who would have invented? I mean, some men are pretty creative, I don't know if you have any Star Wars fans in here. I was a kid who was into science fiction and all of that stuff. But you look at those creatures in Star Wars and the fuzzy things and the, with, with all sorts of you know, elongated, they're just sort of taking creatures we have on the earth and snatching a bit here and a bit there and putting them together. It's, it's all imitative. Who would have thought of a duck-billed platypus? Who would have thought of a kangaroo hopping around with this big baby? I mean, moms, <laughs> we would veto that one, wouldn't we? Carrying that big baby and it's, it's got legs that are, you know, got pointy claws. You're gonna... Who would have thought of a wombat? What a creature. And, and you can almost understand why Steve Irwin was so excited about these things. And while we were there, there was one, we went to the koala bear place and there was this lady talking about how many millions of years ago koalas were up in the, the tree and decided that they wouldn't come down because there were things down there that would eat them and so they had to eat eucalyptus leaves and, and it was all this evolutionary thing. And then we went to this bird display and the woman speaking there said, this bird was designed for this activity. Which is it? Is it chance they just end up on the top of a tree? We know better. It is a God in his infinite wisdom who sovereignly said, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make that, I'm going to make giraffe in Africa, I'm going to make lions, I'm going to make kangaroos. And they're going to jump around Australia. What a marvelous! Sovereign God who put everything in its place. Sovereign over creation. What we see didn't just happen. I mean, that's, 
I don't know about you young people, but just think about it. When you're a teacher, perhaps if you're in a state school, the teacher says, well, it just happened this way and over billions of years. Just think about it. You really think it happened, just happened? What the second young lady said, it was designed. It's very evident. God sovereignly put all these things on the earth just as he willed. He is sovereign not only over creation, he's sovereign over providence. We read in Ephesians 1.11, and I'll just quote the verse, that he, uh, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works, underline, all things according or after the counsel of his will. In other words, if we paraphrase that, Whatever is, is God's will. Whatever happens is God's will. He works all things according to the counsel, that is the wise, premeditated, worked out plan that he willed to accomplish. Then it also means, if we trace this out, God's on a throne, He's accomplishing his purpose. It means that God is also sovereign over salvation. What are the works of God? The works of God, and I would name three, are creation, providence, and salvation. And God did not relinquish his throne in any of those three works. God is sovereign over salvation. Just one text among a multitude, Acts chapter 13, verse 48. I remember as a, a young Christian when someone shared with me this truth of God's sovereignty, and I was trying to uh, grapple with it and understand it. I came across this verse, Acts 13, 48. Paul was sharing the gospel in a synagogue setting, and the Jews rejected it. And Paul said, therefore, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. You don't want it? God's plan is not limited to Jews. We're turning to the Gentiles, verse 47, for thus the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that's the Messiah, that you should bring salvation to the end of the earth, quoting from Isaiah 49. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Now, many people try to put that backwards. As many as believed, God then appointed to eternal life. God elected those whom he thought would elect him. But that's not what the text says. That's exactly backwards to what God declares. And it just blew me away. You mean the fact that I have come to faith in Jesus is something that God purposed way back when, before he made the world? Yes, that's what the Bible says. As many as had been appointed to eternal life, these are the ones who believed. God is sovereign over salvation. And when you begin to see that, Man becomes very small, and God becomes very great. God is sovereign over salvation. Now, what does that mean for you? God's sovereign. He's on a throne. What does it mean for you? Well, it means this. God is king. And it means when he says every knee will bow before him, he means every knee, Richard Dawkins included, every knee. The macho man wrestling crocodiles, and I'm not referring to any individual, his knee will bow, your knee. Now, there was a time when I was preaching on that passage as a young man, Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I was preaching this passage at a, what we call in the, in the United States, a rescue mission. 
And it was in downtown Newark, and in Newark there were street people who would, uh, drunkards, who would live on the streets, and in the summer they were okay, but in the winter it got pretty cold, and they were in trouble. So there was this rescue mission where they could go and get a warm meal and a warm bed, but before they got there, they had to listen to preaching. So this was kind of their ticket to a warm bed and a warm meal was to have to listen to, to young preachers uh, such as I was. But I was preaching this passage and there was this one hulking big drunk guy in the front row. And as I was going through the passage, he kept mumbling and muttering and even almost in a loud voice uttering, who is this God? He was challenging me. Who is this God? Well, the passage was there before me. And I looked at him directly. There were only a handful of men, maybe half a dozen to a dozen. I don't remember the exact say. I remember him. But I said to him, Bill, and I think that was his name, Bill, God says, every knee will bow. The day will come when you are going to bow before this God. And the day will come when you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it is better if you today bow before him. You know what happened? Uh, this guy was huge. If he had landed a punch on me, I would have been a bloody pulp. But I, he was so drunk that I figured I could dodge him and get out of the way quickly. So I was, I was fairly bold and direct in my statements. You know what happened? All of a sudden, he broke down and wept. He broke down and wept. And he, he sobbed and he said, sorry, kid, you got to me. And who knows what God is doing? Well, I, I had dealt with drunks before because I'd been to this mission for a while now. And I didn't have any great hopes that when he woke up out of his drunken stupor that he would even remember. And, and as it so happened, uh, it seemed that he didn't. And the news came within a couple of months. He was discovered dead on the streets of Newark. You got to me, kid. But he went on his drunken ways. Now, dear young people, I'm declaring to you a God who is sovereign. And you can bow to him now and own him, and just like these Gentiles, you can rejoice. What a great God! I want him for my God. I want his mercy. I want his grace. And we'll come to that in the next point. You can go on in stubborn rebellion. But God says, you will bow because he's a king. How much better to know him now and have him as your king and be his servant, his child, his sheep? Will you bow before him? Or will you go on like Bill in stubborn rebellion? Only in the last day to bow, because you will bow. But I want to go on to the third and last point. God is a God of absolute perfection. He's a God of unrivaled sovereignty. But thirdly, he's a God of infinite goodness. Now, for those of you who were at the camp, we saw something of that in his dealing with Elijah there at the juniper tree in his uh, pouting and uh, in his misery and his uh, self-pity. But I want to, to speak of it more generally here. It's not enough, you see, to say God is sovereign. Because if you think God's sovereign, you might think of some angry being who is the cause of all your misery and all the more be angry and upset with God. You need to parallel in your own mind and heart the doctrine of God's sovereignty and hold it as one pillar uh, along with God's perfection. But also you need to hold to the fact that God is a good God, a God of infinite goodness, a benevolent, kind, gracious, loving God. Not just one, not just the other, but both together. Let's look at several passages here as well. Psalm 119, verse 68. Psalm 119, verse 68. 
a passage I preached at the funeral of a little boy who was a, under five years old, and the verse was a comfort to his mother. Psalm 119. Yes, God is a sovereign God, but what else does it say about this sovereign God? Psalm 119, 68. You are good, and you do good. Teach me your statutes. God, uh, uh, David, when he saw who God was, and David knew God was a king, and when he saw that God gave him a law, it was a perfect law, he did not want to run away from God and hide from God and be at a distance from God. Distance from God. He wanted this good God to teach him his statutes, his commandments, his ways. Because God is good. His law is good. And dear young people, instead of thinking that somehow God's law, God's some sort of heavenly uh, watchdog who wants to keep you from having fun. Now that's the way the world talks about him. It's not true. Because God's law, and yes, there are do's and don'ts in it. Don't get me wrong. But God's do's and don'ts are for your good. And he gives those rules, those commandments to us for our good. And David, knowing that God is good, and he's good in what he does, David says, teach me then your good laws. What a good attitude for us to have when we think of God. God, you're good, your word is good, your law is good. Now let's look at another passage. Psalm 103. Turn back. Psalm 103. Psalm of thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O my soul. That would be a good psalm for a Sabbath. Good psalm to begin your Lord's Day with. Uh, perhaps not every Sunday that you sing it, of course. That's not what I'm suggesting, but meditate. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is in, within me, bless his holy name. Why should we bless the Lord? Well, look down. One of the reasons David considers, verse 8, The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, you can chase around the globe and you'll never get there. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the father, so the Lord rather has compassion on those who fear him, for he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. What a father we have. Think of the child running and playing scrapes his knee, runs to his father, Daddy, Daddy! Does the father kick him and say, Suck it up! Bit, get, get tough! Of course not. The father, I hope your dad would be like this, I hope your fathers would be like this, bends down, scoops up the child to his arms. Oh, son, daughter, tell me, let me, let me kiss it. Isn't that better now? We have a God who is compassionate, tender in his love to his children. He knows our frame. Didn't he know Elijah's frame there under the juniper tree? He didn't deal with him harshly. He dealt with him compassionately. So is our God. One more text. Exodus chapter 34. Perhaps the classic text revealing God's goodness Remember that Moses had asked God, show me your glory. And God said, all right, I'll proclaim, I'll hide you in the rock, I'll, I'll go, go up on the mountain, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will declare my glory. That's what happened. We read verse 6 of chapter 34, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate, and gracious. Who is our God? This is what he says he is. 
slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth or faithfulness who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet, there's another side to God's character, who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations abounding in loving kindness, perfect in his justice. You say, wait a minute. How do those go together? He said he forgives iniquity. And he says he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. How can he forgive and still be just? You know, here we come to that climactic revelation of God's goodness. Maybe you've wondered. You've... Pastor, you've been talking mostly in the Old Testament. God is a God of perfection, a God of sovereignty. Yes, of goodness. But yes, here is the ultimate revelation of God's goodness. God forgives iniquity, and yet he doesn't leave it unpunished. How can this be? How do I know God is a God of love? Prove it to me. And maybe some of you who have faced suffering, and you can think in particular ways as I speak of the anguish of soul that you have experienced. You know, for young people, the anguish, and I've been young once upon a time, the anguish you face is, you, I failed an exam. Or another anguish, my pet dog died. That was a heartbreak to a 12-year-old boy that I knew very well. As you grow older, the heartbreak, heart breaks grow larger. Where is the proof, you ask me? Show me God's a God of love. After all I've been through. Here it is. God so loved the world that he gave his only, only begotten son. Why? Is he a cruel father? He put his son to death? He's not a cruel father. He gave his son that whoever believes in him would not perish, would have his sin forgiven, would have that iniquity taken away and receive eternal life. You want to see the proof of God's love? You want to see the proof of what is declared here in Exodus 34? Look at the cross of Jesus forgiving iniquity, by no means overlooking sin. He punished sin in the person of his son on the cross of Calvary. Well, that's our three points. A God of absolute perfection. You agree? What a great holy God. A God of unrivaled sovereignty. He sits, he sits on a throne absolute throne no counselors no advisors he doesn't need them but also and you put them three together you don't take them apart a God of unrivaled absolute infinite goodness as well infinite goodness and love well What's the challenge out of those three things? For the older generation, some of us, you've, you've come to this church because this church holds those truths. A sovereign, holy God. A good God. And that's why you came here. Isn't it so? I believe it is. You say you believe these truths, but do you live in the light of them? Or when you're Traveling and the light turns red and you're already a couple minutes late for the office and you say, and why did I have to turn red? Or why does it have to be an accident right here? Or why do I have to have a flat tire now? Or kids going to school, you've heard God is sovereign. Why did he have to put that bully in my class? God 
is sovereign, but God is good. His ways are perfect. We may not understand them, and we don't. Let's just take that for granted. We don't know the end from the beginning. We don't see how the tapestry is going to come out. We see this thread, and we see that thread. We don't have the whole picture. Just think about Joseph there on the back of his camel. And they tied him up, strapped him on the back of the camel, and perhaps he was riding backwards. And there are his 11 brothers, or his 10 brothers, rather. Benjamin would not have been in that cartel, counting the money of what they had sold their brother for. Hmm. Well, this is better than killing him. They got money for the deal. Joseph's looking back. My brothers! I was bringing them food. Dad sent me to check on them. And the camel goes over the sand dune, over the hill. He loses sight of them. That's his last sight of his brothers until they show up in Egypt to buy grain. And a lot happened in between. Potiphar's wife, thrown in jail, etc., etc. Now, what about you? Wouldn't you say, man, God blew it here. I don't know what God's plan is, but it's not good in my case. That was not Joseph's conclusion. Brethren, you believe this? Live in the light of it. I don't see the end from the beginning. I don't know why this tragedy. I don't know why my baby died. I don't know why my husband is like this, my wife is like that. I don't know why I lost my job. I don't know why this economic crunch has happened. I don't know why a drought, and then I forget the drought now because of the flood. God has a tapestry laid out. The plan and the purpose is put in place. God's a good God. He knows what he's doing. And though we don't see it all, we say, God does. That's good enough for me. Do you live in the light of what you profess? But dear young people, that's the God your parents have come to know. That's the God we come here to worship. Don't you see something? Has God given you, I hope, a little glimpse? This is a great God. This is not some little puny God that you control and you pull the strings and God does what you want. You put your money in and push the button and God answers your prayer. That's the God of many churches. You know, we manipulate God, He gives us money. We manipulate God, He gives us what we ask for. That's not the God of the Bible. This is a great God. Young people, do you have a vision of that? Do you catch sight of it? Let me read you something in closing. I first read as a young Christian, it was, oh, within the first couple of years of my Christian life, as I was going through the scriptures, I came to Isaiah 40. I just want to read selected verses here. And as I read, I want you to think, this is the God we worship here. Verse 9, to start off. Isaiah 40, verse 9. Isaiah writes, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Hear or behold your God. And since that's what this sermon's all about, it's worth shouting about. It's worth crying out to people. It's worth sharing with those who are in darkness and ignorance. And the word of God said, Zion, that's all of Jerusalem. And, and God is crawling to his people, proclaim who I am. To Judah, yes, and we know from other passages to the nations. Let's see what Isaiah then goes on to proclaim. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult? And who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. 
I dwell in a country of some 7,000 islands. Some of them are fairly substantial. God scales their dust. What a God. Let's look further. Verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the vault of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. We stretched out that canopy there, and in a minute it was up. God stretched out the heavens. Let there be, and there was. Verse 28 to 31. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet... Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Dear young people, I've tried to explain to you and to all who this God is that we gather to worship. He is a God who is perfect and holy. He sees our sin. He is a God who is sovereign, who sits on a throne. He is a God who is gracious and calls you not to stay away, not to hide, but to come to Him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, said the Savior, and I will give you rest. And here you are, and you can go your own way and rebel. Your knees will bow before Him come that judgment day. It wasn't yesterday. No man knows the day or the hour. But the day is coming. Make no mistake about it. We just don't know when. And if anybody says they do, you know they're wrong. But it's coming. How much better? And we've seen he's a good God. He's worthy to be served. It's a saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus came to save sinners. Young people, you as well. I hope that you would come to know, worship, adore, love, serve, yea, even be willing to give your life for this God who gave his son to save the likes of you. Let's pray. Our God, we bow before you. You are a great God. And we have seen just a glimpse from the scriptures of who you are. We have had, as it were, a taste of these good and rich things. Things that thrill the souls of your people. As a refresher, a reminder, oh God, we bow before you again and say, thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for opening our hearts to receive the truth as you did Lydia's heart. And oh, we ask that you would do the same for those who are young among us, for those who are old and still hard of heart. Oh God, nothing is too difficult for you. You can take a stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. We ask you would do so even this day. Through Jesus our Savior, we ask it. Amen.